Hola, buenos dias. It's my pleasure today to discuss with you the first lecture in this series. Um, we are going to talk about the diagnostic phase in uh, putting together project documents for housing um, and slum upgrading. Because we are talking two different things, I will be explaining a bit on each as we go through the, um, the, the lecture. These are examples of vacant housing in many countries, as you see. In your region, uh, there are 5 million housing units vacant in Mexico. So there are 64,000 vacant units in China, 18.4 in the US, 5 million in Mexico, 3.3 in Maharashtra, India, just one state, 1.5 in Spain. This phenomenon was studied in, in 2014 when we were doing the global housing strategy at UN Habitat. <clears throat> and this uh, tr triggered some thinking along this line that produced the global housing strategy. So citizens took action and instead of these vacant houses, which they could not afford or go to, they went to informal settlements. So we have examples in Argentina, the Villa Miseria in Bolivia, Ciudadela, Brazil, Favela, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Honduras. In fact, in all the countries in the region up to Venezuela, we have these uh, different names, but it's always the same informal settlements, uh, pejoratively called slums, but we prefer to call them informal settlements. So, as I said, in 2014, there were over 120 million vacant housing units globally. So 500 million people could have properly been housed, yet 863 million people live in slums. The supply does not meet the demand. In today's figure, the, the number of uh, people living in slums is over a million, a billion uh, and, and growing. And the vacant houses are also uh, increasing. So many countries and cities have housing strategies, and these are usually read to build a number of housing units, let's say 200,000 over five years, uh, maybe or 200,000 per year, 20,000 depending. And this uh, is what we call an output-based strategy. In fact, the strategy should be to house the number of households per year so that it becomes a result-based strategy. Why have most countries failed in providing adequate housing for their citizens? The major causes could be summarized, and there are many more, into failure to plan in advance. So the public sector, the, the municipalities, did not plan for affordable and uh, accessible land and housing for the lower income groups. There is a scarcity of land due to speculation and hoarding by big uh, owners. Selection of poorly located housing away from jobs and services, as we saw in, in Mexico, the commute of those houses that are vacant was like three hours. So people just did not go and, uh, and buy, even though they were accessible and cheap. Lack of public transit to link the housing estates to the cities they surround. The construction costs is another big factor, usually going up due to the use of large scale contractors and contractors and private sector preferring to build for middle and high income groups for quick return. So these do not become accessible to the lower income groups. Finance is an important issue and there is a lack of affordable housing finance, unavailability of adequate accessible financing uh, to build and purchase housing and unavailability of variety of tenure options like cooperative, rental, etc. And of course, operation and maintenance, uh, if they are poorly constructed housing, poor insulation, um, cheap piping, uh, electric wires, etc. After a few years, these have to be uh, changed. And usually this puts a big burden on the lower income groups. When we think about housing, the first thing we think about is the housing components. And these are land, finance, basic services, design, building typologies, and, and material components. 
But we are mistaken by thinking only about this. We are thinking in a housing box. We should go a step earlier and look at the national and local urbanization prerequisites, look at national urban policy, urban economy, national legislation, urban planning, local economic development, and local legislation. And of course, not forgetting the governance and management elements <coughs> where we are talking about tenure types, governance, management, and maintenance. And that, from that, we learn lessons and go back and improve the whole uh, how to address housing demand. In facing the housing crisis, <coughs> three levels of intervention and guidance let's say global policies have been established, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, the New Urban Agenda, and the Global Housing Strategy. So in terms of the objectives, uh, we know that Objective 11 is looking at cities and, um, and human settlements. The Sustainable Development Goals in Goal 11, to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. The first sub goal is by 2030, ensure <clears throat> access for all to adequate, safe and affordable housing and basic services and, and upgrading slums. So the new urban agenda let's, uh, tells us that by 2050, the world of urban population is expected to nearly double. This poses massive sustainability challenges in terms of housing. In the shared vision of the, of the countries that subscribe to the agenda, <clears throat> all the UN nations. Th uh, paragraph 13 says that we envision cities and human settlements that progressively achieve the full realization of the right to adequate housing. Our principles and commitments state in paragraph 14 to achieve their vision. Countries are uh, ensuring public participation, providing equal access for all to adequate and affordable housing. They also commit to promote the provision of adequate, affordable, accessible, resource efficient, safe, resilient, well connected, and well located housing, stimulate the supply of a variety of adequate housing options, and promote equitable and affordable access to sustainable, affordable, uh, serviced land and housing. Here we talk about the, the global housing strategy, which was uh, adopted by the UN uh, the member states in 2013. And from it, you see what we just discussed, uh, the, the bigger vision for addressing housing in a, in a more complex and integrated, interrelated way. Rather than just looking at housing elements, we're looking at economy, we're looking at uh, environment, we're looking at a variety of different elements that are important in uh, the development of, of the city rather than just housing. So to enter into the diagnostic phase, we need to put the things in perspective. And the, the important thing is to look at the project cycle. The project cycle typically in, uh, includes the programming phase, followed by identification, formulation, project approval, implementation, and evaluation. These six major steps are further divided into each one into two. Uh, we're going to cover in this uh, lecture today the programming uh, part, the project request, and under identification, project identification, <coughs> and project design. The other uh, slides, the other stages will be covered later on in other uh, lectures within this series. So within the programming, the project request, we have two major types of project requests, the demand driven by city or country or an area and the policy support by donors and governments. So the project request in terms of policy driven, we have the global SDGs, the new urban agenda, national housing policies, etc. These are big policies that drive uh, requests for housing projects uh, that are at a lower level within cities and certain localities. 
there are program driven projects like a national or city housing and or slum grading programs and if these exist it would be good to fit your projects within those because then you might access funding you might access technical support etc and political support uh, then there is the demand driven which is where the community local government political pressure is put to address housing needs or to upgrade informal settlements and the supply driven is when there is a do donor driven or private sector investments etc and these might not meet the demand as we've seen a lot of private sector housing is left unoccupied and here we are going to focus on identification the project identification and project design so policy led programs and projects national or city led would have objectives, expected accomplishments, indicators of achievement, output related to each of the expected accomplishments. The demand-led projects, on the other hand, are community demand-driven, based on field mission and desk review, stakeholder identification, a process to identify the challenges, problems, objectives uh, that need to be identified. We will now talk about the desk and site visit analysis. So this, the first stage is to do a desk and site visit analysis. These are at the city level, the environs around the site and the site analysis itself. Legal, programmatic and institutional setup. Housing slum grading policies. We need to review the existing ones. If there is a national housing policy, review the items that impact on the project also at city level if there is a, a housing policy review that so that you work within that framework it's always more effective if it doesn't exist then uh, we need to work uh, to put some assumptions and some guidelines for ourselves during the project design and implementation institutional and policy framework the housing policy Identify the useful elements guiding and supporting the project. If there are strategies, identify the arrangements in place to ensure that the housing policy is implemented. And the programs <clears throat> need to identify if project can fit under an ongoing program and benefit from it financially, politically, etc. Legal and regulatory frameworks and codes. If there are any housing, land and building codes, urban planning regulations, zoning, land use, etc., and regulations controlling building materials. Slide 37, legal, programmatic, and institutional setup. Local economy, and people usually when they do housing, if they just design units and don't look at local economy, have a big problem. Here, the local economy gives, you need to look at the economic vocation of the city and the surrounding neighborhoods of the site. Is there industry, services, tourism, etc.? Because this can help you target those who are going to live there and know their, their needs and demands. Also linking the housing to the economic vibrancy of the city, making it more viable. Also, are there available job opportunities and income generations, generation opportunities around the area existing? This applies both to uh, new housing and to uh, informal settlement upgrading. Housing finance, as we mentioned, is very important. So the housing finance institutions serving the areas, are they providing mortgage loans, housing credit, microcredit, other forms of financial services that are affordable, of course, to the income groups that we are <coughs> targeting? Effectiveness of the financial institutions, the response to the housing finance demand, and then the housing and or slum upgrading subsidies that could be utilized, either provided by government or by uh, other sources. Then we need to look at the cross-cutting issues, issues, women's rights, laws regarding land and housing, government departments, ministries dealing with youth issues, and assistance given to young people in entering the housing market. They are usually kept out of the, the loop. City and site, site environs analysis. Environmental and topography analysis is very important, particularly in this day and age where we have climate change, as we are seeing impacting 
uh, the, the built environment all over the world, uh, between uh, fires, between flooding, etc., etc. So the key environmental elements to be protected, whether there are wetlands or fragile um, areas with with uh, richness of, of biodiversity, hazard prone zones to be avoided, the flood and mudslide, the f- prone areas, fire hazard areas. So these are no build zones or special protection if possible. Protection, uh, pollution, pollution sources to be avoided or addressed, like polluting industry, very high noise, etc. And the weather properties, wind directions, windfall, temperature, humidity, etc. Then for basic infrastructure provided for housing and slum upgrading, the key institutions and organizations involved in basic infrastructure provision should be contacted. Housing regulatory framework, specific laws and decrees affecting services, infrastructure networks, expansion programs related to your site. Will water, will sanitation be supplied uh, soon enough to be viable with your project or not? Social services, <clears throat> identify the existing planned accessible social services in the vicinity, education, health, etc. And which basic services should be provided within the project, either to serve the project itself or the surrounding areas. Site-specific uh, uh, analysis. Site boundaries and properties. So the access to and road network around the site, road networks and public transit lines surrounding the site, the shape and area of the site, topography, suitability, type of soil, the views, etc. Then you have the site regulations, if they exist, what are the densities allowed, the building types, the land subdivision regulations, and other specific regulations. So very important is to have a participatory approach <coughs> to project identification and prioritization. We need to engage the key stakeholders in the development of the, the, the project document itself, the project concept, and uh, to precede the design itself. So we need to involve central government, local authorities, civil society, community representatives, community-based organizations, slum dwellers organizations, academia, private sector, and external support agencies. These would would create what we call a project stakeholder partners. And some of these representatives of these could be in an advisory board. By bringing all these actors on board, we are ensuring that there is ownership, that the different levels, central, local government, etc., and the different, and the NGOs and CBOs, all these bring something to the table. Uh, The government agencies can facilitate, can prioritize, for example, delivery of water or electricity, etc., to your site if they see that it is a viable project that will solve housing problems or or, uh, the upgrading of an area will improve the conditions because that, in the end, reflects on the city as a whole. Academia should be seen as a very important player because they can provide a lot of uh, thinking and design Uh, and maybe even support in the implementation, Uh, in some cases at no cost or very low cost. Being in the city, they know the the issues much better than people from outside. And they, with the students, uh, could could include a lot of the the field work uh, that uh, at at, uh, maybe no cost. Uh, Private sector is a very important other partner that could invest in the area. So if you're including some some economic activities and uh, income generation uh, activities, the private sector might be encouraged to come and invest. And this can improve on the design and the viability of the area as a whole. We think a lot of participation as just creating a a consultation and just informing people. But if you look at the, the, uh, the, the ladder of participation, it starts with a bit and unfortunately with manipulation and therapy so just showing people that you're talking to them and but you give them no power a bit at the higher level is to inform them and to have a consultation and to placate them and these are degrees of tokenism ideally to reach a higher level 
would be to create partnerships, delegate power, and give citizen control. So degrees of of citizen power. And the aim in in designing the project, if you are able to go up the ladder, <coughs> then you have a more successful project design and and implementation, etc. And as I said, if you have the private sector, the local authorities and so on, so local authority might be able to encourage private sector to start businesses there, maybe with a tax cut for three years. So now you have two actors outside your project and outside your your uh, your potential residents or informal area dwellers that can provide, combine together a, a good solution to improve the living conditions within those uh, areas that are needed in addition to the infrastructure, the construction itself, and, and of housing and so on. Let's talk a bit about the participatory consultation. In the diagnostic stage, you probably cannot go beyond the participatory consultation, which is already midway in the, on the ladder. But by doing this, you are able to engage the stakeholders and keep them on board throughout the project development, financing, implementation, etc. So hold a consultation, including key stakeholders. Now that you've done the, the desk study and the field visits, you present the findings of those and the analysis. Solicit more information from the stakeholders to fill gaps. So you get a better picture of the existing conditions and the, the requirements. Then conduct a SWOT analysis, looking at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of all the elements we mentioned. So environmental elements, economic, social, um, etc. Uh, identify the target group priority needs. And this is where it's important to have representatives of civil society, the, the, the CBOs, uh, NGOs, and others so that you're making sure that you're addressing their needs in terms of physical as well as affordability, etc., etc. Encourage commitments from stakeholders to become partners and have ownership throughout the project cycle. And then the outcomes of this should inform your project design process. So the identification process goes through uh, data review and collection, as mentioned, a consultation, the SWOT analysis, agreed priorities, and then project proposals. <clears throat> These are like one-pagers of a certain project that, in, in let's say, say, in a slum grading project, they need a, <coughs> a child care center. So one would would write a little project document on what are what is the is the project uh, to look like, uh, a health center, etc., etc., market, and so on. Also within the new housing, if you need a service that might serve not only the community you're building for, but the surroundings, let's say an elementary school, here is where Ministry of Education should come on board and they might say, yes, we, we can provide it here. And, and so there could be a kind of cross subsidy. The, the roads might be covered by, by the ministry or by the municipality, etc. So by putting in a clear understanding of what is needed within the site and in the surrounding environs, uh, we can have a better uh, project design. Here we would like to talk about some criteria for designing housing, informal settlements and upgrading projects. So five main areas we need to look at. The urban design, which is what pulls together all the thinking. So you have to improve the quality of and utilization of public spaces, improve mobility, by introducing a rich variety of urban uses. So you can work and, and go to recreation, education, facilities, jobs, and so on within the area. Promote social integration, cultural viability, and street life. Then we look at the three main elements of sustainability, so economic, social, and environmental. So the economic stimulation include mixed uses to attract economic activities that would generate jobs and income generating opportunities for different groups encourage through incentives the private sector to invest in the area introduce urban agriculture for job creation 
and food security instead of decorative landscaping or unused open spaces. Share land value to, in, to introduce solutions to finance, to finance household and housing uh, improvements. Identify high value areas based on location to accommodate productive and commercial uses. Social integration, address social mobility through improving tenure, security, and encouraging social integration and interaction with the surroundings and the rest of the city. In informal area upgrading, introduce right-based concepts, avoiding relocation except through consensus and with well-designed win-win solutions to improve the living conditions of those relocated, such as to uh, such as to reduce extremely high densities or to make way for high return investments to improve the whole area, including those relocated. Ensure that proposals and are gender responsive. Environmental improvement, achieve neighborhood and, and environmental sustainability, improve microclimate through vegetation, preferably productive urban agriculture as mentioned, and urban elements, furniture, etc. Promote the use of local, natural, and recycled building materials, passive solar design, climate uh, suitable design methods. And as mentioned, also if you can maintain the the fragile areas and natural drainage systems. So pulling together, we started with the physical urban uh, planning and looking at the three elements of sustainability, then how do you manage and govern this through partnerships? So integrate a, a dialogue with key actors, including central and local government, private sector, civil society, professionals, and academia. Encourage corporate social responsibility to improve the living conditions and uh, the urban environment through contributing to implementing some key elements of the proposals and introduce academic social responsibility whereby students and academia provide policy advice and technical know-how to local authorities and communities in design, operations and maintenance and the physical environment in new and upgrading projects. We have now covered the identification uh, diagnostic phase and if this is done properly, you're going to get a good project <clears throat> that is viable and successful. It is like going to the general practitioner for a checkup, and if they send you to the wrong specialist, then the, the body will fail. So you need to, to, to do a proper diagnostic uh, phase so as to in, ensure that the project design and implementation uh, move in the right direction. So now we we, the rest of the cycle after the formulation, the appraisal, the funding, the implementation, the monitoring and review and the startup phase, and then the evaluation, the project completion and lesson learned, that gives you input then to the next stage, which is uh, the policy and upscaling. And you go back to another cycle after that. Finally, to, to get to a proper Participate, participatory process, we need to build the capacities of stakeholders um, for the diagnostic and project development. While this might not be possible if you're just dealing with a project, but if some of the participants here are, are in local authority, it might be interesting for them to look at how to improve the, the possibility of partnership and, and stakeholder development so that you get a, a viable uh, project community that works together and produces the right things. Slide 54. So the stakeholder capacity development for participatory planning and decision making, the process itself as you know, includes the stakeholder mobilization, the uh, profiling of the city or the area you're working in, a consultation, either at city level or at the site level, implementation and institutionalization. Each of these or the whole process is supported by the SDGs, so that guides us in how do we do these things. And 
there should be gender mainstreaming throughout. So if you want to build the capacity of local authorities, that's both the elected leaders and maybe some of the technical arm of the municipality, and the, so the council and the municipal uh, authority. For stakeholder mobilization, we're talking about communication and facilitation. When you do the profiling, you, you need to enable and to negotiate with the, the different people to agree and to, and to reach into uh, policies and decisions. So you need to have the policy maker, the decision maker. In implementation, the power broker to reach up to your political representative and to reach up to financing systems, oversee an institution builder, and finally being the leader and guiding the environment. For local authorities, for, for uh, this covers the local authorities, for civil society, NGOs and CBOs and slum dweller representatives, we need local leadership training, the same as what we give to the local leadership. Uh, uh, in the city and then also how do these NGOs improve their human resource development, the financial resources and outreach to the community. Usually civil society and local authorities are in conflict so we need to build bridges through the participatory planning process that we mentioned and uh, if things are really bad then you need to talk about how to do the conflict resolution. A lot of these tools were developed by UN Habitat. Uh, some of them exist in Spanish and uh, might be useful uh, resource uh, for people who are interested in how to improve the participatory process. I will stop here and thank you for your uh, time and uh, hope that this is uh, useful. And if there are any questions, please uh, let me know. Thank you. Gracias.